Peace. Welcome, everybody. Salam, namaste. Great to see you all here today uh, on a Saturday. Um, and welcome all of you to our event, uh, Crimes Against Humanity from Palestine to India. Um, we have uh, two uh, great panelists with us here today. Um, and uh, we also have some snacks and food in the back. Of, you know, please uh, help yourself. And, you know, just to start off the event, I want to talk about why we organized this in the first place, you know, what's some of the connection between these two things. I want to quote, you know, from the words of a, a great Palestinian poet, author, journalist, a revolutionary, Hassan Kanafani. You know, he said that, I know what I know, which is that the history of the world is a history of weak people fighting against strong people of weak people with a just case, with the correct case, fighting against strong people who use their strength to exploit and oppress the weak. Um, you know, the, the, the cause of the Palestinian people is a national liberation struggle, right? It's a cause of a people fighting for nationhood and self-determination. Um, you know, many of the crimes we see in India um, are of a different paradigm, right? It's, it's communal crimes against uh, marginalized populations. But one common trend we see is this historical revisionism that's used by the right wing. You know, to put it plain, people saying that something used to be here on this land, something of ours used to be here a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago. And because of that, we have a right to destroy. We have a right to displace people. And we have a right to use violence towards our end. You know, and this historical revisionism that's being used by both, you know, the, the right wing forces in India and by the occupation in Palestine is, is something that we want to connect. Um, and particularly also uh, in light of growing ties between the Indian state, the Indian government, and the Israeli occupation, right? With the Indian state uh, offering not only diplomatic support, but um, increasing, you know, uh, arms exports, uh, offering laborers, uh, you know, to supplement the Palestinians that are no longer working exploited jobs within the occupation. Uh, so for these reasons, right, we wanted to connect, uh, you know, to speak on both the, uh, the Gujarat uh, pogrom, the massacre, right, commonly referred to as the Gujarat riots of 2002, um, and, you know, connected to the situation in Palestine of the 75 year plus occupation, I mean, over 100 years, you know, if, if you count the, the British occupation of Palestine. Uh, so with that, I, I also want to introduce our two panelists for today. Uh, for those of us uh, from India or from the subcontinent, uh, Tista Satalvad, uh, you know, needs no introduction, but luckily we have people here from all walks of life and from all over the world. So I will give an introduction. Uh, Tista Satalvad um, is first and foremost a journalist of 39 years, um, who along with her partner Javed Anand, uh, first uh, helped pioneer the concept of independent niche journalism. In August 1993, after a decade in the, you know, quote, mainstream print media, including the Daily, Business India, Sunday Observer, they launched Communalism Combat, a monthly magazine that was published until November 2012. Now they co-edit an online portal, Sabran India. Uh, she's also a courageous human rights activist and co-founder of Citizens for Justice and Peace, formed in 2002. Since its founding, Tista and others uh, from CJP have worked tirelessly for justice for the victims and survivors of the post-Godra pogrom in Gujarat, which results in nearly 2,000 people, uh, primarily of Muslim faith, being killed and countless women being brutally raped. Uh, the Boston South Asian Coalition is very honored to host Tista. Please give a big round of applause. I want to also point out she's joining from India time, you know, so it's very late at night for her. So it's a particular uh, commitment. Um, and I want to uh, also introduce uh, Salim Halal, a good, good friend of mine, good comrade. Uh, Salim is an organizer with the Answer Coalition, Act Now to Stop War and End Racism, and has been very active with the Boston Coalition for Palestine, which is a big uh, coalition of you know, progressive 
organizations in Boston fighting for the Palestinian cause. Uh, Salim is a proud descendant from southern Lebanon, from the south, uh, small town of Lebatia. Is that correct, Salim? You know, from, from, from the hills, from the mountains of southern Lebanon that gave birth to a resistance movement, both against the occupation of Lebanon and against the occupation of historic Palestine from the river to the sea. Um, so please give a big round of applause to Salim. Um, and just in terms of, you know, structure for the event, uh, first we'll have uh, Tista speak um, and we'll, uh, you know, uh, have a Q&A with her, after which we'll, we'll have the portion uh, with Salim, want to respect the time difference in India, uh, although she has promised uh, to stay as long as she can. Um, so with that, please give another big round of applause for Tista and we'll hand it right over to you. Thank you so much for that extremely warm introduction. And I'd like to begin with my very warm greetings to my fellow panelists, Selene, and uh, express my huge admiration for all the work that uh, he and others are doing to raise the Palestinian voice uh, uh, in the United States and all over the world. Uh, friends, we meet today, uh, uh, February 2024, which is formally speaking, if you mark a date, uh, 22 years uh, after the horrific uh, Gujarat pogrom. Uh, there's not another date that I think is quite important for this particular conversation today. And that date is uh, 6th of December, 1992. And what do these two figurative anniversaries uh, depict about what uh, we are going through today in India and what they stand for? Uh, 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 when we come to Gujarat and the uh, 22 years uh, of a pretty gritty and robust battle for substantive justice, a collective battle for substantive justice and state accountability at great cost that many people have paid individually and uh, otherwise. Uh, the question I think we ask ourselves sometimes we've been in the midst of this struggle is, is the glass half empty when it comes to substantive justice? Uh, and accountability, or is it at least half full? It's a very difficult question, as such, as such questions always are. And uh, when you look back and think of maybe the fact that uh, we got 174 people actually convicted uh, to life imprisonment uh, and asked in principle for life imprisonment and not death penalty, uh, unlike what was uh, afforded by the courts to the uh, accused of the Godra train burning, uh, on the matter of principle as committed to reformative justice, not retributive justice. Uh, and that out of these 174, 124 were to life imprisonment, the rest were uh, petty convictions. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, of course, many of these were watered down by the higher courts as uh, time went on and even political circumstances changed. Uh, so yes, it, it, it taught us uh, some uh, uh, gritty lessons. Uh, it cost us uh, uh, what, what, what such fights normally do, what such struggles normally do. And uh, which is why I think it's important when we reflect back on the Gujarat program uh, to maybe begin with a slight and a small glimmer of hope. And that glimmer of hope came on the 8th of January, 2024, when uh, uh, Bilkis Vanu, one of the most uh, 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 amazing icons of this struggle, collective struggle. Uh, a woman who was less than 20 years old uh, when uh, uh, five months pregnant, she was brutally uh, gang raped, uh, uh, stepping outside her maternal village. And uh, her three and a half year old daughter, Saleha, was, uh, her head, head was smashed and she was killed in front of her eyes. Mother and sister, cousin, sister, both also gang raped, and 14 people totally from her family massacred. Uh, there are many, many extremely grisly uh, personal accounts that I can share from the Gujarat uh, program, but Bilkis is possibly one that stands out uh, uh, particularly. I may, met her the first time in the first week of March uh, 2002, and then again on the 22nd of March uh, uh, 2002, 
when the NHRC under Justice Varma, uh, uh, former Chief Justice visited. And she extremely bravely, uh, uh, not just recounted the incident, which must have been a hard telling, but also gave us copies of the uh, first information report that she had lodged with the local police station. And then what happens? What happens is the story of unfortunately mass crimes uh, in India, where uh, a complete uh, uh, unaccountability from the police machinery, lack of independent investigation, uh, insensitivity in the judiciary leads to, by 2003, the JFMC, which is the junior ma the magistrate in our locality, uh, actually accepting the closure report, which in effect means that accepting the fact that there is no evidence to pursue the case. And uh, fortunately, the uh, National Human Rights Commission shows particularly particular interest in this case and <clears throat> ensures that she gets robust legal aid. And then the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, hers was the second among the two cases that were transferred out of the state of Gujarat. The first one was in one, the one in which my organization was involved, the Best Bakery case. In the Bilkis case, we were not directly involved, but the NHRC was, and both cases were transferred out of the state of Gujarat. And um, uh, in 2008, the Sessions Court uh, gave conviction, uh, uh, one set of convictions, and then the Bombay High Court, because that was the jurisdictional court where the uh, uh, court of transfer had taken place, the state of Maharashtra, you find that uh, not just were the convictions upheld, but the uh, policemen and the doctors as well who were held, uh, who were charged, cheated, but not held, uh, not convicted in the lower court were also convicted. So in fact, one of a story which actually reflects substantive justice. We can go further, 2017 and then 2019, when the Supreme Court upholds the convictions. And in 2019, for the first time, actually grants a sufficient and fair reparation. Her story should have ended there. She should have lived in, with some element of peace, mental peace, and uh, a sense that of closure, maybe some closure, at least that some justice had been done. Uh, but no, uh, the 14 convict, convicts who were convicted uh, were from uh, 2019 right up to 2022, when we, uh, when we, when we all were shocked and numbed by the story that burst upon us uh, through the quote-unquote news that they'd been given um, hasty remission, which means that they would be set free. But even in that interim period, uh, after their conviction in 2008, they had been out, out on parole for an obscene number of times, showing a very close complicity between the Gujarat administration and the accused in her case, like in, accused in all the cases to do with the 2002 massacres. So a complete absence of remorse in the state and the way they dealt with Bilkis. And uh, how do you deal with this? I did this amazing interview with her lawyer after the uh, uh, 19th of uh, February, when uh, the Supreme Court summarily, uh, uh, sorry, 19th of January, when the uh, Supreme Court summarily uh, uh, dismissed the uh, appeal against the remission, and they had to surrender by the night of Sunday the 21st. And uh, uh, the, the sheer joy and, uh, that Bill Keyes felt, uh, her sense of faith in the justice system was redeemed. But I'd like to add a rider here that why was it shaken in the first place? Why was the sense of justice shaken in the first place? Because you had a state uh, in Gujarat from 2002 onwards, and a state today, which is the rest of India, where the state has absolutely no accountability or remorse to its, towards its citizens, even when state or non-state actors are perpetrating extremely heinous crimes. So Bilkis is, is a glimmer of hope and a, a tale that is worth telling. But for, me, for many of the others who are survivors of the Gujarat pogrom, the, the story has not been uh, similarly uh, so full of redemption and hope. Convictions that were upheld by the uh, special court set up by the Supreme Court, thanks to relentless efforts by our organization, like in Naruga Party and Sardar Pura, were let off by the High Court uh, the, uh, as, as the atmosphere changed. And even now, 
case like the Kulberg case is still stuck in the High Court uh, in its appeal. We didn't get uh, um, serious convictions in that case. And we all know, and I can't speak about it publicly, the fate of the Zakia Jaffi case. So it is actually a, uh, a, st a tale which is incomplete. Uh, like I said, we don't know whether the glass is half empty or half full. But let's come to the wider question and the question of where we stand in India today and why along with uh, 27, 28 February 2002, 6 December 1992 is such a crucial day for this particular conversation. How that day was actually both a very violent rupture and a point of departure for a journey that India undertook uh, after independence, pretty bravely, I think, and I say, uh, despite and in spite of the horrors of partition, where we chose uh, and, and, and chose with a kind of pragmatic and principled choice to remain uh, uh, wedded to constitutional principles and remain a secular democratic republic. So it was a point of departure from that uh, that that extremely important uh, mo point of ours, which was 26th of January 1950. Uh, and it was a point of arrival for those forces that had never really been ever content with the, the step that India took when uh, we gave ourselves the constitution. And uh, for all the for all the gains uh, the, uh, naysayers who, who would like to suggest that the constitution is a foreign document has been <clears throat> imported from outside. I think they have very little knowledge of history and uh, very little knowledge of the sheer robustness of the freedom movement and the independence struggle, the, the struggle of small adversaries, the small agrarian classes, the uh, farmer, the uh, all sections of Indian society that rebelled against colonial rule and for centuries before that, hundreds of years before that, probably from the uh, early medieval period, maybe even before that, when Buddha was uh, burst upon the scene and challenged caste, the the uh, the age-old conversation between the Shaman and Brahman, and age-old age-old voices against a structured inequality have been as rooted in the soil as the <clears throat> extreme cruelty of entrenched caste and Brahmanism. So it has been an ongoing battle of the Indian people, and uh, that eventually culminated in constitutional values. So December 6, 1992, including the day that it was chosen for the demolition of the Babri Masjid, and we know when we've lived through India at that time, what that demolition meant. It was not simply the demolition of a mosque in full public view with the, with the stigmatization and demonization of India's Muslim minority that went with it, but it was also a declaration of <coughs> majoritarian, the coming of a majoritarian state structure, which had already crept upon us even before that, when we saw uh, communal violence, bouts becoming more and more like pogroms, whether it was Meerut, Malyana, Hashimpura, Nelly, 1983, February, and of course the anti Sikh pogrom, 1984, uh, uh, Bhagalpur, that you saw signs of this happening. And it's all this was happening as the forces of majoritarianism were impinging and creeping more and more and influencing the Indian state before a final takeover, as we see now. So, and, and, and therefore, I think 30th January 1948 is also very important because it was also a signal of that same intent that why was the assassination of Gandhi so critical for these forces, for a man who actually believed in his version of the Sanatani uh, Hindu faith, but still stood against untouchability very stoically, stood for the rights of the Palestinian people, and also stood very clearly for a secular state, for a break from religion and state. So there are many, many connections to be made and many, many things to be understood. And we have very little time to make all these connections, but I think it's important to remember that December 6, 1992 was chosen for a reason. It was chosen because what is, what was and what is 6 December to many of us who know it in India. It is Maha Parina Nirvan Divas. It is the day in which we lost Dr. Baba Sahib And for <coughs> a large section of India's 
uh, Dalits and Adivasis. That day signifies a day when they actually uh, uh, commemorate uh, a man who actually stood for their emancipation, Dr. Bhimrao Baba Sabambek. But to choose that day for actually the demolition of Babri Masjid and make it Shaurya Divas, which is the kind of triumph, a triumphalism cause of Brahminical Hinduism and its influence on the state, I think is not a pure coincidence. So the Indian state itself has veered very sharply towards a majoritarianism, a socio-economic religious right, and a far economic right. And of course, we know that it was the party that preceded uh, the present party in power that actually brought in certain economic policies, but there was still the cushion of a welfare state. There was still the cushion of the certain uh, older tradition within, in, in the uh, Congress party that were committed to the direct principles of state policy and the welfare state that allowed this constant uh, counterbalancing between a push towards <coughs> uh, public resources going to private capital, but also this cushion for uh, uh, Manarega, uh, Forest Rights Act, right to information, right to food, right to education with all its limitations when the law was passed. So there was a kind of counterbalancing constantly going on. And there lies, there lies some of the difference. But coming back to where the Indian state has gone and uh, where we stand today, that uh, uh, there's so many pointers that we can see between the first and uh, first uh, first stint of uh, this uh, regime in power between 1999 and 2000, and then we seem to have a 10-year respite, and now, and what we are facing today. And I think uh, it's not insignificant that even in, as a minority government at that time, you saw the signs very, very clearly. You saw the kind of clear changes that were being made in, say, the collected works of Gandhi as they were published by uh, the uh, Union government. Uh, at the time, you saw the attempts to change the education policy and the value education policy and bring in Hindu and Vedic values of education at that time. And then the allies protesting a lot, particularly the allies from the south of India, who, who, who certainly uh, took strong objection to it. And most critically, the, 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 the danger that we are facing today, huge danger, and my organization works, Citizens for Justice and Peace is working on the ground in Assam, and we, we know the dangers of uh, exclusion from citizenship and what civil death that means for uh, maybe a third of Assam's population of 3.3 crores uh, who are today potentially deprived of Indian citizenship, that it is the India one government under Vajpayee that actually passed the uh, uh, amendment to the Citizenship Act. Uh, Section 14A was uh, inserted which allowed, legally allowed, and the law stands today, allowed for the creation of a national identity card and uh, based on a national population register, that would actually be a house uh, enumeration of residency of citizens based on documentation, which itself is a very dangerous idea. And I'll come to that a little bit towards the end again. But what I think really marks this regime of the last, uh, uh, nine and a half, ten years, and I think what typified uh, the Gujarat program of 2002 and what has typified bouts of such targeted uh, programmatic communal violence against India's religious minorities and also uh, Dalits, but I think we talk about minorities today, uh, has been the uh, use and the consistent and very, very pernicious use of hate. Hate is political tool, hate is state project, and hate is media design. These are the three categories I can see of the last 10 years. And uh, we have seen consistently, particularly since 2014, elected officials, uh, 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 members of the uh, union cabinet, state cabinets, wherever the Bharatiya Janata Party is in power, uh, abusing their uh, positions of constitutional authority and actually either themselves making extremely instigatory hate speech and uh, through that uh, directly affecting the dignity and equality of life of a large section of Indian citizens, particularly Indian Muslims and to some small extent Indian Christians. And I think this use of hate has significantly sullied and poisoned the public atmosphere, affected 
Uh, I remember even in 92, 93, when my city, Bombay, burned after the demolition of the Babri Masjid, that uh, the Samna, the newspaper then published and still published by the Shiv Sena, which today Shiv Sena is on the other side of the political opposition, uh, actually for six or eight months before the violence broke out post demolition of the Babri Masjid, had consistently created a certain uh, climate through the regular use of hate writing. And I think it is this quality of hate speech and hate writing that we are actually witnessing. And uh, I've witnessed both as a journalist and uh, uh, as a civil rights activist that the, that the actual preparation of the ground for physical violence takes place by the use of such systemic hate speech. And the, it's non-persecution, uh, it's uh, the non-intervention by the courts, the lack of jurisprudence on the issue, the lack of public outrage against the issue, the silent complicity of the majority uh, uh, on hate speech and only a very tiny section speaking out. All of this creates an extremely conducive atmosphere for actual violent attack against the minorities to take place. I, we, I saw this extremely closely in Gujarat. I saw this in 1993 in Bombay. And then I as I started looking back and examining the Riot Commission reports from uh, 61, Jabalpur, to Ranchi, uh, 1969, uh, to uh, uh, Meerut uh, Malyana, uh, 87, Bhagalpur, 89, uh, uh, anti sikh pogrom, 1984, Nelly, 1983, February. You actually can reconstruct and find how this kind of public rendering of hate and public non-contestation of hate actually allows for a massacre against a very, very uh, marginalized section to not just happen, but to be legitimized by the wider public. And I think this is the uh, absolute uh, vindication of that politics that we are actually living through in India today. And uh, the fact that this has been a very slow burn built up, build up for almost 30 years before that has not helped because you do have not built up uh, uh, robust institutional measures to counter it. Now, our police is not equipped, uh, if, if not completely communally poisoned. Our judiciary is not equipped. Uh, if not uh, iffy and uh, not wanting to touch uh, such cases, except in the rarest of the rare, on rarest of the rare occasions, and most people do not wish to contest this and speak up about this in public, and hence it swirls around you. It swirls around you this hate speech from the village to the mola to the small town to the large city, so much so that today uh, you actually have large electronic media channels. Uh, and I'd like to particularly flag this issue uh, in terms of the composition of uh, Indian parliament now. Uh, you have Indian media channels who are more and more owned by large corporate houses. And I say this shift to the social economic right and the uh, uh, economic right. That if you see that uh, the, the composition of billionaires in parliament and that the who are these billionaires? Actually, owner of mining companies, telecom companies, and television companies. So you actually have a complete stranglehold then on parliamentary democracy, and <clears throat> none of the debates that you see ha happening at news are on television have anything to do with, I know, either uh, unemployment or uh, the farmers' agitation that we are seeing going on now. I mean, again, a second round of the farmers' agitation that is that has begun at the beginning of this week. And as we saw the week progress, as we saw the week progress, we saw more and more clampdown by X, formerly Twitter. Uh, YouTube has some, some little uh, independent videos coming out, but YouTube, uh, sorry, Twitter has actually blocked Twitter handles like Gaunka Savera and many farmers leaders who were actually using uh, uh, X or Twitter to, to ensure that they counter the blackout by the uh, commercial media. I don't call it mainstream media anymore. It's pure commercial media. So and coming to uh, the introduction that the young uh, person made about India and uh, Israel and uh, the connection between the two, it's shocking that the, the major corporate conglomerate, conglomerate that this uh, particular regime in India is extremely uh, close to or has even spawned uh, Adani is actually <coughs> responsible in Hyderabad, I think, to manufacture some of the drones that are going to Israel and Israeli drones are being used <coughs> to attack our farmers. 
So it, it's not just simply about money and figures anymore, but we are seeing a very, very brute level, uh, visible uh, connection of this kind of uh, exponential uh, cruelty and visibility. Uh, so lynching, stigmatization, homelessness, statelessness, use of the bulldozer. I mean, which face of the Indian state and which face of the in, uh, Indian state's violence seems more obscene now? I think it's a question we, need, we ask ourselves every day. Uh, it seemed bad enough when you had someone like Mohsin Sheikh or Mohammed Akhlaq or Junaid or Pehlu uh, or uh, uh, Hebar or I mean, uh, Tabrez, all these names being killed in extremely brutal fashions, their videos being made and being put out by their perpetrators on the social media and the killing celebrated, much like the release of Bilkis Banu's masks rapists were not just celebrated, but facilitated by the ministers in the Gujarat government today. Similarly, <clears throat> the perpetrators of these lynchings were actually celebrating the act of violence against vulnerable minorities, Muslims. And this is being celebrated. And of course, there's not a word of uh, uh, censure or uh, shock or rep uh, uh, reprimand from the powers that be, which, which actually signifies tacit, if not explicit, consent. And therefore, we are really seeing uh, a complete uh, uh, takeover in that sense of the Indian state, a complete change of the nature of the Indian state, which is actually, in one sense, I would say, declared a war against all sections of its own people, because though Muslims are the major target, political target, you also have uh, as a target uh, Indian Adivasis, the indigenous people, because there's every effort to dilute the Forest Rights Act, which was uh, a legislation that was won and enacted after many, many struggle of the forest working people. To see the labor codes being brought in during the COVID pandemic time, we saw the way the union government and the state governments uh, treated migrant labor and the mass, uh, mass uh, uh, exodus that took place on foot, and that no facilities on the railways was made available to our working populations. We know the state of public health, uh, and the kind of deaths it took during the COVID-19 pandemic, something that appears to have completely disappeared from our memory and consciousness uh, in states like in the in like the capital of Delhi, in states like Uttar Pradesh, where you had you had obscenely high number of deaths and tragic deaths, and uh, very visibly macabre scenes, including bodies floating down the uh, Holy Ganga, etc. But they don't; they seem to have just vanished from our public outrage and consciousness. And that is why, uh, is it because there's just so much of an overload of, uh, of, of uh, despair and hopelessness and hate that uh, people are not able to react anymore, but whatever it be the reason, it's an extremely, extremely worrying situation. I like to just say a few words uh, before I suspect that time is going to be up soon uh, on uh, the sheer desperate dangers of, of the trident of the Citizenship Amendment Act, NPR and NRC, which is likely to be thrust upon us any day now. We've been told that the CAA uh, rules, which had not been notified since 2019 when the act was hurriedly passed, uh, will, will be notified any time before the election. That has been the threat. And we also know that the NPR and the uh, NRC is actually uh, legally permissible and an, an investigation carried out by Citizens for Justice and Peace along with some fellow organizations in Bengal, which we released to the media only uh, day before yesterday, uh, shows that there's been a rather un, unlawful seeding of Aadhaar data to create an NPR database. Uh, and now we possibly can be told tomorrow that there's a 119.34 crore NPR database ready without following the due procedure laid down under Section 14A, which is house to house remuneration, informed consent, informed information, etc. And Aadhaar, as we know, is for a completely different set of purposes. It's for just proof of residence. It's not proof of citizenship. So we are actually faced with a regime that is, uh, has, no sanctity, has no respect for sanctity or, or privacy, data, law, constitution, and is actually uh, steamrolling its way through Procedural justice, substantive justice, procedures of parliament, the way they passed so many 
laws as money bills. Uh, we have a complete uh, manifold attack on possible freedom of the press, the press registration bill, the broadcasting bill, the digital digitalization bill, and the post offices bill. I mean, so which battle is fought when? Uh, we, we had some good news on the 14th of February when the Supreme Court uh, knocked down the as unconstitutional electoral bonds, but the decision came six years after they had been first challenged and brought in. So <clears throat> we are seeing a very, very slow uh, pushback uh, as of now. Uh, we know that in 2016, uh, when Hyderabad Central University, the Jawaharlal Nehru University, uh, uh, and so many of our centers of learning, uh, which for years the left had battled and finally made diverse and accountable so that students from uh, the most varied communities could get the same access to quality higher education uh, that, that, uh, that the privilege have always got. Uh, you suddenly saw the cutback in the junior scholarships, uh, the junior fellowships, the senior fellowships, UGC scholarships have been completely cut down. And worst of all, it was our student leaders that were made out to be in this demonical construct as enemies of the nation. And they suffered for it, they fought the battle. And today, uh, just as in the 2019, 2020 battle against uh, the CA and PR NRC, you had a robust movement from the Muslim minority uh, with its young leadership emerge to, to challenge this very threat to their existence as Indians. Uh, you found a very, very brutal pushback by the Indian state. And uh, even today, as I speak, uh, leaders, uh, thinkers like Umar Khalid, uh, Gulfisha Fatima, Miran Haider, uh, and I mean, at least 18 of them and all are incarcerated for over three and a half, four years without recourse to bail. And there's no sign of their trial beginning. Uh, we know the weaponization of the law that has taken place under this regime the UAP, the PMLA, uh, so many, so many laws are used. And now, of course, the political opposition is also the target. So all in all, not a great uh, picture to paint. Uh, and possibly, uh, given the fact that we are talking about the worst uh, post-independence pogrom and the 22-year anniversary of that kind of uh, state-allowed violence, if not state-sponsored violence against the minorities of Gujarat, it's not. It's not. Uh, it's not ironic to find that when that regime actually moved uh, from Gujarat to Delhi, that it took some of the most repressive measures that we saw for for decades uh, experienced in the state of Gujarat are now kind of experienced by all of us nationally. Uh, too little to hope for, but I think the struggle must carry on. Thank you so much. Give another big round of applause for Tisa, everyone. Tisa, if you are able to stay with us, um, what might be good is if we can have a Salim go and then if we can do a joint Q&A. Is that okay with you? Right on. Um, that'll invite you up. How's everybody doing? Yeah, this is uh, 15 minutes earlier than I planned to speak, but I'm gonna roll with it. Um, we all know my name, Salim uh, Khalad, right? Boston Coalition for Palestine. Oh yeah, we can go louder. <clears throat> okay, is this good? Yeah. All right, yeah, that's a lot better. Um, yeah, so I'm from uh, South Lebanon, you know, so I'm very uh, intimately familiar with uh, Israeli violence and the Palestinian cause, but I'd like to start with something. Raise your hands if you've heard uh, that the uh, issue in Palestine is complicated, right? Raise your hand if you've heard that this is a conflict that's been going on for thousands of years. 
Exactly. Right? That's uh, obviously um, made up. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, historical revisionism, right? Which simply put is the process of rewriting history to suit a particular agenda. And we see this across imperialist, fascistic regimes all over. This is nothing new. The legacy of Zionism is one of violence and malicious misrepresentation, tracing back to the foundation of the Zionist entity of Israel, right? They have a malevolent mythology that they use in conjunction with their violent imperial tendencies. So let's start with a joke. I heard this, uh, this was back in 2009, uh, by George Mitchell. This was at a press conference uh, he was appointed as the chief Middle East negotiator for President Barack Obama. And the context of this joke was that actually in the 1990s, he was the chief negotiator for the Northern Ireland negotiations, right? And so he said to the crowd at the time, just recently I spoke in Jerusalem and I mentioned the 800 years. And afterward, an elderly gentleman came up to me and he said, did you say 800 years? But yeah, 800, 800, 800. Ah, such a recent argument. No wonder you settled it. What an insidious, malicious lie, right? In this one joke, we capture a few myths of the Zionist entity. That the Jewish and Muslim people have been at war for thousands of years. And that's why to this day, you've heard this, Israel has a right to defend itself. And there has never been a right for an invader to defend themselves. This doesn't exist. We know that Arab people, Muslims, Christians, Jews, Jewish people, right? They've been living in harmony for thousands of years. Whether it was in Spain, back under the Moors, right? Whether it was in Baghdad, Baghdad, excuse me. We know that early Jewish settlers in Palestine survived through the aid of the Palestinians, much as early colonists here survived relying on the Native Americans, right? It was the European imperialists who persecuted both Muslim and Jewish people throughout history. The Reconquista in Spain, the Holocaust in Germany, the pogroms in Tsar in Russia. It is imperialism that gets back into Zionism, emerging as a colonial project from the bourgeoisie, not the people, murdering the wrong people who don't support them. And where we see non -Jew, more non-Jewish Zionists participating than there are Jewish people alive. This is not a religious or a one-sided conflict. It is a national liberation struggle it's a struggle of an occupied people against their occupation, where they have the right to resist by any means necessary. Let's take a look at another popular one. A land without a people for a people without a land. Who's heard that before? So this was corroborated by the British Empire, right? Uh, in 1917, uh, there was the Balfour Declaration, which was basically a British promise for a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Was Palestine the British to give away? Even in a colonial sense, right? The declaration was made while Palestine was still under Ottoman control. This is the kind of brazen attitude of the imperialists. Britain's Foreign Secretary, Arthur Balfour, sent a letter to Lord Rothschild in 1917, member of the British House of Lords, which read, <clears throat> Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. 
who are these existing non-Jewish communities? They're the Palestinian Arabs, right? Comprising 92% of the population at the time, owning 89% of the land in 1917. Not once in this letter did we see the word Arab. Palestine did not belong to the British to give away. And this is a blatant erasure of their existence. Corroborating the Zionist myth of being a people without of being a land without a people. That is being a land without Europeans. Why, why Palestine? Why did the Zionist project choose Palestine as its base? We have the early biblical kingdoms of Israel and Judah, right? Thousands of years ago. The first one in 1000, you know, before Common Era. It's about 3000 years ago, right? When an Israeli army led by David conquered the Canaanites at Jerusalem. And the very last Jewish kingdom, which fell in 586 BC, right? That's still 2,500 years. Since 780, Palestine was predominantly Arab. So regarding this settlement from thousands of years ago, Jewish writer Eric Fromm said, if all nations would suddenly claim territory in which their forefathers had lived 2,000 years ago, this world would be a madhouse. <clears throat> The Palestinians indigenous to the land were living there peacefully up until the Nakba, right, 1948, where they were either massively displaced or murdered. This is the reality and cannot be chucked off the settlement from thousands of years ago, and it was never about finding a Jewish homeland. The Jewish immigrants could have lived peacefully with the Palestinians, as they had always done, as they could be doing now, and just as they will, when the state of Israel is dismantled and Palestine is free. It's important to remember that it was not just Palestine who was betrayed by the British. They had their hands everywhere. The other Arab nations who were controlled by the Ottoman Empire prior to the end of World War I were promised an independent Arab state by the British if they helped fight back against the Ottoman Turks. Right? While this promise was made, the European imperialists were busy dividing the Ottoman Empire, right? The Middle East going to France and Britain, and what became known as the sykes picot Agreement. It was a secret agreement and only became public. Does anyone know how? So when the Bolsheviks took control of uh, uh, Russia, they leaked the agreement and said, also, we want no part of this. You can always count on us. We Arabs felt firsthand the subjugation of these colonial powers, as well as the betrayal of promising a national home, our national home, to the Zionist project. It wasn't their land taken away. After this sykes picot agreement and the end of World War I, with the split of the Middle East between the French and British, right? The British got Jerusalem, uh, Damascus, Iraq, Jordan, and the French got Lebanon. Uh, these divisions were arbitrary, right? Like the Arabs were, and still are, we are one people. Um, there was barely any division between southern Lebanon and Palestine, right? Um, and this was just divisive in the, in the face of our unity, nationalism, and self-determination. So soon after, delegates from Palestine, Lebanon, and Syria met in Damascus at the General Syrian Congress in 1919 to repudiate this agreement, the Balfour Declaration, Sykes-Picot, and the Zionist project in general. Here's a quote from that. <clears throat> How can the Zionists go back in history 2,000 years to prove that by their short soil in Palestine, they have now a right to claim it, return to it as a Jewish home, thus crushing the nationalism of a million Arabs. So 
So there's a very short idea of a greater Syria, right? A unified, liberated Arab state quickly gets clashed by the French. And opening the door for this idea of greater Israel. Who's heard of that? Eretz Israel. Okay. Basically, the culmination of the Zionist project to include parts of Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Egypt, the West Bank, that's that, right? And the present uh, Zionist entity as it is. And speaking of Lebanon, the Zionists were obsessed with the Lutani River, right? Citing how useful it would be and how, you know, unnamed the neighbor to the north, Lebanon, wouldn't really miss it and isn't really benefiting from it. And, you know, where God was less precise in putting the river in Lebanon, Mother Nature offered the river as a natural frontier. They even tried to control uh, Lebanon, like through the French, they wanted to make it a Christian state. They backed uh, the fascist phalanges in the, uh, you know, prompting the Lebanese Civil War from 1975 to 1990. The, uh, at the time, facing them were uh, the Lebanese uh, communists and the uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization. And they only lost because uh, Syria at the time intervened um, in the hopes that one, you know, communism would not spread to Syria, but also if we intervene now, we can appease Israel and the US. When has appeasement worked against the fascists? It doesn't work, right? Uh, <laughs> so the war lasted for 15 years. Um, Israel invades Lebanon, right, in 1982, uh, stayed there till 2000, but they were not able to control Lebanon. They were repelled in 2006, and we've been fighting with Palestine ever since, right? It's not just Lebanon, right? At all. Yemen, Syria. They, uh, they won't stop, right? Israel is, in, is founded on violence, it's a state of violence, and without violence, it cannot continue. We have to fight back against this historical revision. It doesn't matter, even if thousands of years ago, there were a couple of kingdoms there. What matters is that there were people in Palestine living in peace, who were forcibly moved out or murdered for colonial ambitions. It's not complicated. When we recognize Zionism for what it is, an imperial project. We've had our work cut out for us here in the Middle East, but so for the first time, I'm seeing a real difference in defeating the Zionist propaganda. We have to continue to get educated and organized, and our resistance has to be militant and in the millions. We can't afford to lose hope or get tired. Revolution requires rest, and we have to be willing to push ourselves to new limits for our collective liberation. With the recent escalation in Rafa, we know that this increasing violence means that Israel is on its last legs, right? We know they're out of missiles. They need the US to refresh their armory. We know also that our own senators Elizabeth Warren, among them, signed in support of the Israeli offense bill, right? Billions of dollars. Our job here in the US is to make the revolution irresistible, right? To make imperialism as unpalatable as possible. For that, we have to make sure the US pulls the plug on their funding and see that Israel is a liability and not useful in the Middle East. On that note, to end, there is a protest this Monday at 2 p.m. We're going to meet in Cambridge Commons 
and we're going to march over to Elizabeth Warren's house. She might not be there, but we're going to make a fuss. We're going to talk to our neighbors. It's going to be great. She's got all her hands, right? And she has to do what's right. Hands off Palestine. Hands off Lebanon. Hands off Iraq. Hands off Yemen. And free, free Palestine. Give another big round of applause for Chris Van Steen, everyone. You know, when we chose, you know, we, we knew that we wanted to do an event, right, about the, the massacre in Gujarat. And we chose to connect it, you know, to the issue of Palestine, not just, um, you know, in an abstract way, right, that these are two causes that we support, but because there's a real history that connects these two things, right? In 1947, 1948, at the same time that the Indian freedom struggle, right, is, is really, uh, you know, coming to fruition, is exactly at the same time, right, that, that the occupation of Palestine is becoming legitimized. Um, you know, today we see the heroic efforts of Yemen, the Yemeni people that are uh, blockading, right, um, the, the Israeli occupation, and we see the British, or bombing them again, right? You know, one, one historical, one interesting historical note is that uh, the south of Yemen, particularly the port city of Aden, was for a long time, many decades, uh, under the same uh, jurisdiction as the protectorate of Bombay, as the viceroy of Bombay, which myself and some other folks here are from, right? So these aren't abstract things. We have shared goals, we have shared enemies, right? When you have shared enemies, you have shared horizons for liberation. And, you know, the last thing I want to say is, you know, talking on the issue of historical revisionism, right? The whole claim to the land of Palestine is that, you know, the kingdom of David used to be there. I mean, let's take a look at the story of David, of David and Goliath. The story of David and Goliath is about an underdog, is about a weak people fighting against somebody that has strength that wants to take it by force, right? So the real story of David and Goliath is the story of the Palestinian people today using slingshots, using their feet, using their bodies, using resistance by any means necessary, right, to win their freedom. Um, and so with that, I want to open up the Q&A section uh, for, for Tista, for Salim, um, you know, to ask any questions about, you know, both the struggle in India, right, for democracy against fascism and for the struggle, uh, you know, in, in, in both uh, Palestine and really uh, against Zionism and against imperialism, you know, in, in all of West Asia and North Africa. So please, I'm going to take you off mute and, uh, you know, if folks want to just raise their hand, I'll come bring the mic to you. First one over here. Thank you so much to both of you for for this evening's talk. Uh, I had a question for both folks and Celine, but I wanted to frame it a little bit differently for each of you. Um, so the, the main question is: We see the language changing in sort of mainstream or commercial Western liberal media around the Israeli occupation, and it's finally being recognized as an occupation and a genocide. And the role of the agitators and sort of shifted from uh, Hamas to Israel in like more liberal. And uh, I think some people, myself included, would say that this might be some part in response to social media, Western social media accounts, things like that. So to be so, I want to ask, do we see some of the diaspora seeking an silence in India, but it doesn't seem to be making as much of an impact? Do you have any thoughts on why this is? How does it like other people are talking about it? Is it the wrong people, the wrong outlets? And so for me, I want to ask, you know, there's a famous uh, thing in the book of the fascists will let you talk about revolution, but never be Do you think that this might be happening? Do you think that the fascists are so confident in themselves that, you know, we are strong enough? Or do you think that this really is how people and we have overcome this sort of easy and confident? Maybe a couple of questions uh, to support that. Uh, 
Thanks for the, uh, the great talk. Um, two questions that we could answer. I think it's for both. Um, and number one, could you elaborate to a little bit talk about the historical connections to see what's happening in Palestine and the bank of the media? What about the present connections? Um, you know, I think you spoke a little bit about, but for example, these are poems, but I'm curious to get people to understand and the safe and stage struggle that actually is a struggle um, against capitalist systems that are really just a subjugation of, of uh, predominantly that crowd on the of people. So there's a, there's a larger human story uh, that we get to understand this is about maybe use, you know, correct systems for the world. So how do you, how do you see about the current connection? Um, and the second question is, where is the place of joy in the movement? Um, that's also really needed. So I think in, in that also really needed. Um, first, I want to say thank you so much for the afternoon and from Nova. So I just I want to take this to my heart. And uh, it's been very, very isolated and difficult past couple of months that really changed how I think life or my piece of crap, I'm just trying to not be so emotional, but we can help it. I can help it. Um, uh, I have found my daughter still. So this adds a whole other layer to me. And as a Palestinian boy in the diaspora, all the stars of Palestinian, I was not born in my own country, my own lands, as a result of Israel, as a result of the occupation. And I think that's part of a lot of people um, who seem to still not understand how to find the Palestinian struggle here. And that I have to explain that I'm more broadly, like I still do. But to be here today, I feel like. I feel honored, I feel privileged, and I think this is a moment in time I will always cherish. Um, so I just want to say thank a lot for making this happen. And it's really interesting because I'm actually visiting from Montreal. I'm not even from Boston, and my first visit is from Boston. So what a beautiful, beautiful memory that I will remember if I went to the first of school. But thanks again for making this happen, and I just want to maybe ask a question. So I find it really interesting that there's this parallel struggle across different communities. And this time around, this is specifically on uh, what's happening to Mount Palestine and Mount Green. It's been happening for 75 years plus. And uh, every other year, there's a war on Gaza. Every other year, the trauma in the Middle East. And uh, I mean, I'm just going to be like, this is, I'm smiling and I'm going on with my life. And then you know, I'm feeling it on the inside. And this time around feels very different though. It feels like something we've never experienced. And living in North America, this is the first time that I really see true awakening. Like, wow, despite this first question, from my language, uh, wow, to see people unite like this, see the indigenous communities come together. I'm sure in the US too, but in Canada, uh, a lot of the Mohawks, a lot of the indigenous people in Canada supporting us and standing for us. So long story short, um, how do we see these parallel struggles um, can be scaled? So I'm just thinking about it more on the scalability. Maybe as a businesswoman in New York, all the time we scale this. Um, but I think this is beautiful. The turnout is amazing. And to see that all of us are coming together, we know for the fact that we're going to the point. But I'm curious to see how can we bring these parallel causes in a way that's scalable, sustainable, and beneficial to Palestinians and all other causes uh, in India and beyond. And thanks again. Um, I don't know, Lisa, the leader, if you want to start us off or if you have some great questions. Um, yeah, I don't know. Tista, we'll give the floor to you first if you want to kick us off with any thoughts. You're also on mute, but it sounds great what you're saying. You'll have to repeat the question because it was a bit muffled. 
Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Uh, so some of the questions are um, the the latest ones I remember, right? Are you know how can it, it's great, right? That uh, folks are starting to make these connections, right, between these different struggles. Uh, how can we really you know bridge this further and make sure that this is something that scales? Uh, another question was on um, uh, not just you know uh, historical connections, right, between these struggles, but also if we could talk more like contemporary connections, right, between the Indian state, between uh, the uh, occupation in Palestine, right, and the, some of these uh, connections that, that are being made. Um, and then uh, also what, what's the role of uh, joy in, 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 this, in these struggles? Um, and then the first one, I honestly do not remember. I'm sorry. I'll, yeah, I'll hand it over to you. See, I think, uh, uh, I mean, some of the connections of, of some of us keep making because uh, when you're in the midst of these kind of struggles, uh, uh, you automatically see uh, the kind of uh, you know amazing struggle of the Palestinian people. And I think in India, particularly, you've had at least 15 cities protesting despite extremely repressive circumstances uh, on the issue of Palestine, okay? Uh, and, and, and what it means and what, what the occupation has meant and what the propaganda of, of powerful states like Israel and uh, US has meant as well and, and the UK, United Kingdom. So people see through that. There's a, is historically people have seen through that and I think young people are seeing through, through, seeing through it today as well. But yes, the, the state here is increasingly closer and closer, not just to the United States, but also to Israel. And is also the right wing and the kind of alliances between the extreme right wing here and they are very, very obvious to see. So uh, I think to build on that, I think to build on that is to build on the stories of resistance. And I think it's very, very important that the stories of resistance, local resistance, the resistance abroad of the Palestinian people, both keep getting told and retold as much as we can, not just in forums like this, but in any, any which way that we can. Uh, I'm sure all of you know what happened uh, in the Bombay IIT, uh, uh, when 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 a talk was attempted to be held, students of TISS, when the students in Delhi, when the students in Tamil Nadu have all tried to uh, robustly demonstrate on the issue of Palestine. So, uh, and uh, increasingly we are seeing, and that's the other thing we need to flag, is that any protest, uh, unless it's as massive and as organized as say the farmers protest in India, is becoming very, very difficult. So if it's a smaller citizens protest of 100, 200, 500, thousand people, two thousand people, it's extremely easy for the police authorities to uh, to just prevent it, to just ban it, to prevent it. So section 144 is applied and it generally protests are being uh, quote unquote prohibited. You just have the United, uh, Uttar Pradesh government just passing an order that for six months, uh, no protest is going to be allowed. I mean, it's a completely illegal order completely unlawful order, but it has been passed yesterday because they're fearing what they're seeing in the farmers' protest. And the courts do not respond uh, as they ought to do when it comes to uh, Article 19 and the right to protest, the right to uh, associate, right to assemble peacefully without arms, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> so it's a challenge. It's a constant challenge. Uh, how you keep having a protest in more creative ways when public spaces are increasingly being repressively denied. How do you keep the joy going? I think by making new and newer and newer friends all the time. And I've been very lucky there that build, build, building allyships with different struggles, uh, not confining yourself to your own quote unquote struggle, but to constantly build allyships with other struggles. Uh, yeah, fun has found a lot of joy through all the pain as well. Um, I believe the, the first question was about, you know, are we are we engaging in the struggle and the revolution to the extent that the fascists want us to, right? Like we're in this bubble of respectability. Um, I I disagree. I but I think that that's you know that's that's why when when we call for militancy, we call for people to join orgs, right? Is that so? We're not just confined to social. Social media is great, 
education is the first part, right? But if you know something and then you don't do anything about it or you don't learn to do anything about it, then you accept that as your reality. And that actually uh, entrenches you deeper in the fascistic regime, right? And you are further from change, right? So education is only the first part. Um, so, I mean, and that relates to the, to the question of joy, I think. Uh, joy is very important, right? And we need, we cannot be, I don't think it's possible to be a 24 hour revolutionary, right? And I don't think nobody's asking you to do that. Uh, I think where we can sometimes get into trouble is when we perceive joy to be revolutionary when we perceive art to be revolutionary, when we perceive education for its own sake. And we have to think of the goal in mind. When we rest, we're resting so we can go to the next protest, right? So we can attend the next talk. Um, because those, uh, these, you know, colonizers, they're not resting, right? They're not resting. They're, they're organized. So we have to be as organized as they are. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks. I, I wanted to say a few words uh, about it as well, um, particularly to the question, you know, about like the, sorry, being for him here, about um, uh, the contemporary connections. And there's a few big ones, in fact. Um, you know, one we see from the perspective of the weapons manufacturers. Uh, so Elbit Systems, which is uh, the biggest, you know, quote, Israeli, um, you know, weapons company in the world, um, met a lot of the foreign direct investment, uh, a lot of the investment from Elbit comes from the monopoly capitalists in India, increasingly, uh, particularly this uh, unsavory gentleman uh, by the name of Adani. Um, and you see in recent years, uh, um, mass export of, of weapons um, from India to the Israeli occupation and also the other way around. Um, and it's interesting, uh, we had a, a, this a great speaker, Azad Essa, in the same room, you know, I think a month or two ago. He was talking about how increasingly um, Israel is allowing strategic investments by Indian monopoly capitalists into key infrastructure, uh, you know, such as uh, 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 ports in, in, in various cities, which you wouldn't just open up willy nilly, right? You wouldn't, you know, Israel would never uh, like allow like Venezuela to invade, you know, invest in these ports. Not that the Bolivarian Revolution would ever do that. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it shows that there's like a, a kindred friendship and an alliance, um, you know, so uh, that's one aspect of it. The second I wanted to bring up is, you know, uh, much of the settler economy, right, the Israeli economy, it's propped up from cheap and exploited labor, right, from the Palestinian population. And particularly in the past few months, I mean, as the genocide has been on steroids, right, uh, they haven't had access to this uh, source of cheap labor. And, you know, they had they basically sent a, they're, they're sending proposals all over the world, right, send us cheap laborers. And one of the main uh, uh, asks was to the Indian government. Uh, and the Indian government has been very happy to help comply with this. Um, you know, and you saw actually a very unified response from uh, most of the Indian uh, labor movement from trade union movement, uh, which is much more organized, you know, and much more class conscious than uh, the, the movement in the United States, where they said, uh, this is not in our interest as Indian workers, right, to go and support this occupation. Um, and so, and the third thing I wanted to hit on is the Indian occupation of Kashmir, right, and the complete degradation of democratic rights. Um, you know, it's not, there's not a one-to-one -one parallel, right, between Kashmir and Palestine. There's historical differences and historical nuances. But what's very telling, you know, is that uh, particularly in recent years, you've seen ministers from India, you know, you've seen government officials saying, well, we have the answer to, to the question of Kashmir. What they're doing to the Palestinians, this is exactly what we should be doing to the Kashmiris. Um, so in similar ways, right, that we see that the United States police departments go and train with the with the Israeli defense forces. It's really the Israeli occupation forces, right? It's not like NATO is not a defensive organization. 
the IDF is not a defensive organization. The whole point is to is to oppress people. Um, and so, um, you know, you see more and more collaboration on how do we surveil people, right? You know, the same surveillance technologies that have been deployed against Palestinians for many decades are being increasingly deployed against Kashmiris. Uh, tactics of apartheid, right, of separation, of uh, selling off businesses, selling off lands, uh, you know, kind of death by a thousand cuts, right, of, you know, chopping up neighborhoods, increasingly uh, marginalizing the populations that you want to marginalize and bringing in the populations that you want to bring in. Uh, so it's both on a level of economic, you know, investment and in ties, military investment and in ties, um, and then also sharing of the ideology, right, where they, it's, it's an unholy alliance, it's strange bedfellows, because at the end of the day, they don't actually like each other, you know, and they all kind of, they hold their own supremacy in many ways, right? It's, like the alliance between the Germans and the Japanese Empire, right? During World War II, it's very strange bedfellows, um, but it's it's very it's hateful people and it's greedy people coming together. And what they also recognized is a, a temporary alliance, you know, between evil people. Um, and uh, we also have a, a good deal of um, I believe we have some questions in the chat as well. I want to read them. Out. Oh no, we don't have any questions in the chat. Uh, but we have some more questions here uh, in person. I just want to give uh, Atisa and Sami um, another round of you know uh, applause for uh, 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 question for uh, Atisa. Atisa, uh, you've been a symbol of courage for your steadfast struggle to bring justice to the survivors and families of the victims of uh, the problem of the child the of the night, more than 100 people were convicted. Um, and, uh, you know, again, a big salute. Um, so I just wanted to uh, pay some attention to what you said. You said hate speech often precedes a problem. So um, again, this is a question which probably doesn't have easy answers, but we should probably be starting defense communities, uh, uh, sorry, defense committees uh, in vast parts of uh, India. Um, um, and I, from what I remember hearing in Gujarat and in uh, Northeast Delhi, uh, in the middle of uh, the violence inflicted by the state, uh, there were some communities that did not allow the militia or the politicians to enter. And those were the areas that were spared of uh, the violence that we saw. Um, is there some truth to it? And should we be using that as a model uh, going forward? Thank you. Oh. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I'm saying it's a very good so, question. Do you mind if we just take another question or two or? Yeah, sure, whatever, yeah. I'll make a note, yeah. yeah. I also wanted to touch on what you were talking about, you said hate speech. I'm a community organizer in uh, Las Vegas, and I live in Boston, and I'm predominantly black and brown, and I live in Boston, and right now I was doing an influx of immigrants, particularly immigrants um, from Haiti, and they are being placed in some of the um, community institutions, such as um, recreational centers, and so the community is losing those centers. And the city and commercial um, yeah. commercial media is um, using that to serve xenophobia and immigrant sentiment, particularly within the uh, you know any migrant uh, black and brown population of black and uh, brown migrant culture. And I just kind of want to understand how to intervene in the hate speech and the hate writing that's happening um, and to fortify the community against this kind of media that they're being, that they're constantly being exposed to so that they're not turning against these people who are really from the same country that their um, generation have immigrated from. Thank you. Um, 
Hi, um, I had a question for both of you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for speaking and taking the time to be here. Um, the question I had was on, uh, I guess, the role of news and education, um, and how how we battle or how we sort of get to the people who are used to consuming news from the so-called commercial mainstream sources, and now are we getting one world of information? How do you sort of push back or help to educate those people um, in a way that is understandable, palatable to them, as opposed to them being, or as opposed to us as being, or I guess, them seeing it as an attack on themselves so that at least they are confused. Thank you. Last question was not clear. Yeah, the question uh, she was arguing about, you know, how many people, right, are used to getting their news from the commercial press, right, from the billionaire form media. Can you hear me? Uh, I'll go up, I'll go up and say the rest of the thing. I'll just say, I, I saw one more. We want to take that and then we can. Or actually, right, we might have the same problem again. Um, so let's have her uh, answer and then we can do one more round to finish up. Could I trouble you to re repeat the last one? I have the first Yeah, can you hear me better from here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so the question was largely around, um, uh, you know, obviously a majority of the population, right, is, is used to getting uh, their news and information from the commercial press, right, from the billionaire-owned mm. media. Uh, you know, how do we really uh, combat that, right? Um, and, you know, particularly get information from <laughs> the, the real grassroots, right, the real mainstream information, uh, which is from the masses of people. Yeah, so I, I, I'll get to the first one first, which is about the defense committees. Uh, and uh, I, I just want to say that, you know, there is there is some uh, some uh, uh, validation and validity in those uh, instances, whether it was Gujarat or Northeast Delhi. In fact, even Bombay, uh, then Mumbai now, 92, 93, saw relative calm and peace where local populations had in a sense, uh, 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 inured themselves and equipped themselves not to fall prey to either rumor, uh, rumor mongering or this virality of hate speech. Uh, but, but what we need to remember is that the difference between 1992, 1993, 2002 and now uh, 2020 Northeast Delhi is that today we have the absolutely vicarious impact of the social media, which actually uh, uh, the algorithms of hate in the social media tend to overtake real time. And uh, even when you have really good instances of uh, this type kind of community, robustness and resistances existing, uh, it's very easy to disrupt because of this virality of the algorithm of hate within social media. But, uh, but what, what, is, what is important to understand is that whether, it, and Manipur, we've not really flagged Manipur at all. And I think that that's really not right because Manipur actually saw uh, a dual impact of the fact that for almost five months, except for seven days in between intermittently, you had the state completely uh, down uh, without internet. And in fact, in, that meant that you had uh, a complete lack of access, uh, free access to information. And I think that really becomes the crux of what we are talking about here is that we need to constantly educate uh, and make, make communities aware of the uh, absolute essential uh, upholding of free speech and, uh, uh, and uh, yet a distinction between free speech and hate speech. What we are seeing what the state is doing is that they are criminalizing hate, uh, free speech and actually legitimizing hate speech. So if we are able to kind of create a, pub a public uh, knowledge base and awareness of what the distinction is between uh, 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 the free speech, including the right to challenge state, state policy at, at its very essential level and, and hate speech, which becomes stigmatizing and actually demeaning and then takes away the equality, dignity and right to life of marginalized sections, then that becomes easier. And we've, we, we've been actually 
carrying out experiments with this at the community level, Citizen for Justice and Peace, through a certain kind of agit prop theater, agit prop skits, real life things in a, in a kind of a controlled mechanism where you deal with the myth and stereotype. You have, you have sort of very easy to and well constructed uh, literature pamphlets which talk about do not fall for fake news, do not fall for misinformation, distinction between misinformation and disinformation, etc. But it's a it's a it's a long haul, and it needs to be very organized. We're trying to also work with organizations like farmers' organizations and trade unions, which are mass-based organizations, to work with their memberships on this whole issue of hate, hate, hate versus free speech, and the fake news versus disinformation. Uh, but we the, but this really needs to be amplified to a much much more significant level. Uh, you know uh, the the uh, the um, uh, the last issue uh, that was flagged here, uh, I mean, it, 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 the commercial media and the influence of the commercial media, you know, it's, it's not insignificant that uh, about, about two weeks ago, about 70 of us met in Bangal uh, Bengaluru. And it was a very interesting exercise. Um, uh, four or five of us had worked on it for almost three months. And we got together 70 representatives of independent media organizations from 12 Indian languages. And, and this included independent YouTubers, included independent uh, YouTube channels, etc. From Tamil to, to Manipuri to uh, uh, Hindi, large, large segment is Hindi, Marathi, Gujarati as well. And I think uh, the figures are interesting that while we have something like uh, 673 million television watchers, and users in the country. We have as many as uh, 93 million uh, smartphone users. And in fact, that is why you find the slew of legislation being brought in to try and curb uh, independent broadcast media. Because I think the uh, st uh, state has begun to realize, government of India has begun to realize that regardless of its propaganda and its shameful propaganda on the commercial channels, uh, you still have a growing viewership uh, for independent uh, YouTube channels and you don't you just don't know when that curb is going to come in and when that's going to be denied and uh, therefore suddenly we are looking at other options now we are looking at internet radio uh, and uh, maybe even uh, and, you know in the long term sense an alternative to youtube which is very very ambitious so uh, but the conversations are happening conversations are happening among some of us practitioners of independent media but it, it means large number of resource, resources and organization so it is something that we need to give uh, give attention to, but it's it's hard, and uh, we are we are also firefighting all the time. We are also uh, producing content. We are also producing reports. We are also on the field. We are small, compact teams, and yet we have to uh, think of also middle term, long term, and future. And we are also thinking of now setting up a legal defense fund for independent news creators uh, because of the increasing attacks and the legal cases that uh, young YouTubers have to face in states like Uttar Pradesh and. Uh, uh, which are the more hostile states, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, and Rajasthan. So it's a multitude of things that need to be done. And uh, yeah, the thought is there, uh, very vigorous thought and attention is being paid to it. Uh, but like I said, it's so many things and so many things and very few of us trying to do it. <coughs> Slightly, some bit of good news is that you still have organizations like the, like the Na National Broadcasting Statute Authority to which, for instance, our organization, CJP, makes at least five complaints a week on the obnoxious stuff that we have to, uh, that we watch on this commercial uh, television. And uh, it's also a huge mental health, mental health issue for our team because you, actually, you, have, you actually have to sit through and transcribe pretty vile stuff coming out in, uh, uh, in extremely vile language and then develop a legal complaint around it. And we've had results. We've had 85% of our complaints being uh, upheld, though it takes one, one and a quarter years to do so. We've had channel, uh, you know, anchors, like Subir Chaudhary and Aman Chopra being filed, fined 50,000 rupees each, but it's a long haul. Each complaint takes eight months to 15 months for to reach its end and fruition, and it requires a lot of rigorous stages along the way. <coughs>
I'm not sure that question was for, but it was not very clear. Oh, got it. Um, the question, uh, can you hear me better here? Yeah. Uh, the question was about, uh, from the uh, the gentleman about uh, the Indian left, right? That um, it's, uh, you know, relatively stronger in the South, right? There's a higher level of uh, tolerance, uh, you know, religious harmony there and um, uh, uh, uh more uh, economic strength as well. Uh, to what degree does the Indian left have an ability to, uh, I guess, uh, intervene, you know, in, in Gujarat and in other parts of the country? Uh, it's a very, it's, it's a difficult question to answer because all of us would, uh, would really like the Indian left to be much more, much stronger uh, than it actually is. Uh, and while it is undoubtedly true that it has the, uh, presence in the South and the moral high ground uh, there, and also in terms of its general articulation uh, on these issues, uh, the sheer uh, uh, aggression of the kind of <coughs> <coughs> assault of this kind of hate politics has uh, not, not really meant there's been a substantive pushback from the political spectrum, including the left. I mean, there's so many issues that I could not even flag in the 30 minutes that I had. Uh, for instance, the Dharam sunset that took place in 2021, the despicable and disgusting Suli deals and bully deals episode where you had the complete public uh, humiliation and stigmatization of Muslim women, particularly articulate, uh, successful Muslim women, quote unquote. You know, and what does that mean in terms of the society, reflection of the society we come from and the politics we have today in this country. Uh, and in all these cases, of course, the women themselves fought back strongly, they were extremely assertive. But if at all there was anybody who was filing complaints on uh, Twitter, on uh, Facebook, getting responses from these authorities, it was organizations like Citizens for Justice and Peace. So I'm, I mean, uh, I'm just saying that, uh, you know, you need the issue of hate speech and hate writing to become a political issue, like many other human rights issues unfortunately do not become because there are so many other issues that the political parties, including the left feel are more important. Uh, the repealment of UAPA, for instance, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very crucial issue. Uh, it needs to be a consistent demand, even if it will happen only when there's a change of regime, but it needs to be articulated constantly. And we find, unfortunately, that in a state like Kerala, and I go to Kerala very, very often, often at the invitation of the uh, ruling party there and the political left, but I I go there on the premise that I say this there, that UAPA is used even in a state like Kerala, which it should not and ought not to be. So this is unfortunately the contradiction we live with. And uh, it's, it's unfortunate. I mean, obviously there's a difference between the left and the center and the right, but you know, when you have repressive laws and then you have states using them uh, for whatever reason, it defies the very uh, objective of, of the resistance. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to, before we start to close up, also give an opportunity uh, to, we have a great, uh, uh, another great journalist, uh, human rights defender here, Akar Patel. Uh, if you want to say a few words, um, then we can say some closing words to wrap us up. Akar, come up front so I can hear you. Thank you to uh, and, uh, thank you to all of you and the Boston and all the uh, It's important that we gather uh, on such occasions. I think the value of solidarity uh, is understated uh, for the most part. It's felt by those who participate, but often those of us on the outside who might not know how it is that we did. Uh, 
be a part of movements, be a part of the anger within us, be a part of something that we need to express. Only need to show up at one of these to be a part. I'll be very brief. Um, those of you who are in the US have a disproportionate of influence on the rest of the world. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, Kashmir went to 17 months without of internet, beginning at the end of 2019. And the only effect on the Indian government in India was, to my mind, uh, how the resolution was settled for. It came towards the end of 2019. It was tabled by uh, Congresswoman Jaipal. It got about 64 votary in Congress. It didn't uh, progress very far. But the government of India felt strongly enough about it to lift that ban within two weeks of the Biden administration for taking office. When she had written up the resolution, it was the Trump administration, which the government of India knew that they could manage. So Kashmiri children spent the entirety of 2020, the whole of COVID, without access to schooling because there was no net. But within two weeks of the administration changing them, uh, that ban was lifted. And I think that's it's important that those of you who can put pressure on your congresswoman, on your senator, on your federal government, on the local government, make that shift. Second point I'd like to make uh, before I close is that most politics, if not all politics, in any democratic society will be local. And I think that while it is true that Israel has very strong supporters here, within government, without government, it is also true that there are very large numbers of people who can make a difference this year in terms of making sure that there is long-term change in the way that both parties, but especially the Democrats, look on the issue. You cannot have zero difference between the Democrats and the GOP on such a vital issue and give the Democrats a pass. They should know that there is a price to pay if massacres are actually allowed to be continued, whatever a, a, a president comes um, in office. And I would urge all of you to organize and make sure that that party knows that there will be a real price to pay if the violence is not ended as soon as possible and that future violence is not ever allowed to happen. Thank you very much. Yeah. To close us off, uh, I want to actually go back to two of the questions that I believe some of our friends from uh, Montreal asked, you know, one on uh, the role of, of joy in, in our struggles and of, uh, you know, how do we make these struggles, you know, each other's, um, you know, in uh, uh, Leila Khalid, you know, great Palestinian revolutionary who's still on the Palestinian National Council, in her foreword, uh, my people, sorry, in her memoir, my people shall live, uh, there's a foreword from uh, Hassan Kanafani, you know, and it's, it's a great quote where he says, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, hate and belief in the past is not enough to make a revolution. Hate and belief in the past is enough for a rebellion, but we must be uh, driven by love and we must be future oriented in order to carry out a revolution. Um, and, you know, connecting this to the issue of how do we make these struggles, right, uh, each other's. I think what's very important is that we don't look at uh, you know struggle in Palestine, struggle anywhere else, just from a purely humanitarian perspective, from a perspective of charity, right? You know, well, look at these people in, in Palestine that are suffering. Look at these people in the Congo, right, that are suffering. We have to make the connection with our own exploitation and oppression, right, with the exploitation and oppression overseas or wherever else it's happening, right? There's a great quote from this, you know, this German philosopher where he says, you know, labor in the white skin cannot be free so long as labor in the black skin is still branded, right? A white laborer cannot really have uh, her rights so long as a black laborer is in chattel slavery or is, is oppressed, right? Similarly, I think this is an issue, right, for us, you know, uh, some of us here are from India or from South Asia, right? Others are from other parts of the world. Right, and, but what really fundamentally connects all of us, what undergirds all of this, 
is our position as laborers, right? It's also our class position. And I think this has also been some of the, um, we've, we've been frustrated, right? You know, over the past few months where so much of our efforts, right? You know, we're protesting, uh, you know, we're, we're engaging in BDS, right? And a lot of our efforts have kind of gotten channeled towards a little bit like from the consumer perspective, right? Don't buy, you know, goods that support the occupation, that go to Israel, et cetera. But the real strength that we have, right, as, as working people is our ability as producers, right? Like the actual like goods and services, right, that happen within our society, within our economy are made by working in everyday people like us. So for us to really, you know, get to a point where we can, you know, meaningfully have an impact, right, from the United States on the struggle in Palestine, India, Congo, you name it is when we connect that our struggles as, as workers, right? Our struggles against racism, against uh, um, uh, sexism, right? Are, are directly connected, right? To, to imperialism overseas, that we have the same shared enemy. Because of course, right? It, it's good to not buy Coca-Cola and Lay's, et cetera. Um, but at the end of the day, it can't just be, we can't just relate to it as consumers. We need to relate to it as producers. It's only when we can say, like, we are going to shut down this factory, right? Not like outside people going and doing something that'll get federal charges, which is heroic and commendable, but as laborers, right, of, of, of these factories, of these institutions, we will, we're no longer going to work to support something, right, that is against our interests. Um, and so uh, I want to also close this off by... Uh, uh, saying just a few more words, uh, the Coalition Against Ap Apartheid here at MIT, this is the essentially the Students for Justice in Palestine group, uh, has unfortunately been suspended by the university. Uh, they're the ones that used to book these rooms for us. Um, and there's going to be also a rally at 5 p.m. today at the Boston Marriott in Cambridge. Uh, uh, that's the Boston Marriott in Cambridge, pretty close by. Uh, so if you can, please also attend, uh, you know, the uh, student organizers are facing, you know, disciplinary charges, right, potential suspension, and they're also advocating for a reinstatement, right, of their organization, uh, which is fighting a just cause. Um, and so, um, yeah, lastly, uh, please uh, give a big round of applause to Tista and Salim. And also, if you'd like to get involved, um, you know, uh, uh, with the Boston South Asian Coalition, right, we do work both in advocacy of uh, on the uh, subcontinent uh, around progressive issues of labor rights, women's rights, uh, Palestine, um, you know, again, both uh, here and overseas. Uh, please speak to me or uh, another one of the organizers. You know, uh, we're not outnumbered. We're just out-organized. All right. Thank you very much. And, Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's a great point. We will send a follow-up email. And they do have like a solidarity petition and, you know, events that are coming up, including uh, the protest at five today at the Boston Marriott in Cambridge. Um, and we'll also have a uh, much larger protest on Monday at 2 p.m. at the Cambridge Common Park. Uh, and we're going to go to Elizabeth Warren's house afterwards. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for coming.